This is Chris M. King from statusflow.net, and you are listening to Vroom Vroom Veer with Jeff Smith, reminding you to get unstuck. Well done. Like the energy. Thank you. <laughs> You're bringing it. You're ready well, to Well, I've been referred roll. to as human cocaine, so... <laughs> I have stories about cocaine. Never, never used this both. stuff, <laughs> but uh, I have a funny story. Okay, um, let me hit stop. I'll be right back. Right. Are you ready to thoughtfully steer away from your revved up, frenzied, and far too often scripted life? Then welcome to Vroom Vroom Veer with Jeff Smith, where he guides you down the road differently traveled by sharing unique experiences with guests who have managed to shift away from a life stuck on cruise control and veered their way into a more authentic and fulfilling one in all sorts of interesting and kind of remarkable ways. Get ready to Vroom Vroom Veer with your differently traveled road chauffeur, Jeff Smith. Leah Durante, thank you so much for being on Vroom Vroom Beer and welcome to the show. How's it going? Thanks so much for having me. I am thrilled to be here. Yeah, you look like you're having fun already. You got your microphone, you got plants behind you. It's awesome. I'm ready. <laughs> so you're at leahdurante.com. So talk a little bit about what you're most excited about in your business today. Today, oh, I am, I'm so excited because it's January, it's the beginning of the year, people are kind of excited by the energy at this time of year, turning the page, a fresh start, um, and I want to help people really harness that energy and actually find success in 2024, because yeah. we know New Year's resolutions, Fizzle. We've, most of us <laughs> have given up by week number three, 90% right. of them fail. Right. I'm a family nurse practitioner, um, and actually all of your practitioners, your clinicians' advice, most of those recommendations, about 90% of them fail as well. And yeah. so I'm really excited to be bringing a free workshop here at the end of January on the oh, 24th wow. and 25th. It's one day each. Wow. Uh, what, excuse me, one hour each day Okay. Uh, to talk about why the model of change around New Year's rec resolutions and doctor's recomm recommendations actually fail, why the science um, doesn't support our development, yeah. and what we can do instead. So Good um, idea. <laughs> yes, I'm excited to bring that to people. And you can use that framework for change, whether you're looking at a health and a fitness goal, a mental health goal, relationship, right. if you're working on something in your professional life or your career, money, you know, all those goals, all those things that end up on everybody's New Year's resolution list year right. after year and never get accomplished. Um, here's a free way to learn how to actually do it. So uh, that will be taking place on January 24th and 25th. So I'm really, I love sharing this information and empowering people with a new way of change. And you can find out all about it at leahdurante.com. Okay. Yes. All right. Slash 2024 success. Slash 2024 success. Keep yes. saying it. Keep saying it. Say it again. leahdurante.com <laughs> slash 2024 success. There you go. Okay. <laughs> so if you don't do anything else, stop, hit stop and go do that. But anyway, <laughs> now we'll have a show. Okay. So you are Leah and yes. uh, you were a championship at athletics while you were still a kid. That's pretty yes. amazing. Yeah, I competed at the World Championships, the World Equestrian Games when wow. I was 13 years old. My goodness. In Capish Far Hungary. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in Hungary. Crazy. In Hungary. Wait a in minute. In Hungary. Did yeah. you grow up in Hungary? No, no. I grew oh. up in California. I grew okay. up in Sonoma, California. Okay, good. The wine country. <laughs> yes. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah. I love yeah. I love wine country up there. That's yeah, great. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. It's so really how beautiful. did you end up in the World Equ Equestrian Championship in Hungary? Well, as a kid, um, there was a local horse barn down the street from our house. And my older sister started taking riding lessons because she was really interested in horses. Okay. And then she started doing this sport called equestrian horse vaulting, which is like gymnastics, but on the back of a real live moving horse Yikes. that goes in a circle. So it's kind of like the circus. It's great. It's very popular in Europe. It's okay. very rare in the U.S. So it is kind of yeah. unique that we had it down the street in our small little town in Sonoma. Wow. Uh, and I got, as the younger sister, got drugged to all the competitions for a year. And I was like, well, this is dumb. If I have to go to all these competitions, I might, as, might well as well compete. compete. <laughs> yeah. So, so I jumped on the horses too. I was like, this is fun. And when you're a kid, it's just fun. The horses are such incredible animals. It's a team sport. There's so much camaraderie. 
And so you're doing um, gymnastics on horseback. I can't yes. even visualize it. So my it. fun fact is I can do a handstand on the back of a horse. I can do wow. a cartwheel on the back of a horse. Wow. I can stand on the back of a horse. Wow. Yes. I've never yeah. even yeah. ridden a horse. Oh, you're missing out. They're pretty amazing animals. I bet. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're, yeah. they're ginormous. <laughs> <laughs> but very sweet but very sweet yeah yeah i get it wow so i i actually live kind of like in a horsey neighborhood here in vegas uh-huh. so there's okay. like a like a big park an equestrian park where they go and people bring their horses and you know run them and stuff right mm-hmm. it's the mm-hmm. first time i've been around horses in my life and i've all, i also discovered that wild horses exist they live yeah. in Rome in the wilds of Nevada. And yeah, they don't they do look, Mustangs. Yeah, 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 they yeah. They're not, beautiful. They do not look like a regular horse. When you no. see it, you go, wow, that's a horse? <laughs> well, I, apparently, the horses that we're used to seeing in movies are these genetic freaks, apparently. <laughs> oh, I, I, I mean, there's been a lot of breeding. That's what I meant. The yes. Astrocrine world. Yes, yes. So that's what I mean. They're, yeah. yeah that's the queer. World. There you go. They, they've been bred to look big and fast. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and have different yes. bone structure and things like that yeah, for yeah, different, yeah. Not, different sporting events, you know. Exactly. Bred for a purpose. There was a time when there wasn't an automobile and horses were a little bit more center stage in the yeah, human yeah. experience. Yeah. And <laughs> I didn't even know this, but you know, the, the term hack, is, hack? Uh-huh. Is, is a type of horse. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So like if you just needed a horse just to do bread and butter work. Sure. And you didn't like, want to get a hack for the you day. You didn't want to break the bank. You got like this hackney or something, a hackney okay. horse. And it was bred to do just bread and butter. It wasn't really all that fancy genetically, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. it would, you know, haul your cart or whatever the hell you wanted you it go. to do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Seth Godin, for enlightening me. There you go. <laughs> okay. So you grow up riding horses, you're 13. Mm-hmm. That's got it. That's a, a weird world to live in, right? I mean, was it really super competitive? And it was super competitive. Okay. And like gymnastics, there certainly was kind of the underbelly of body issues. And yeah. because it's a performance sport, you're judged, right? You're wearing spandex, you know, it, yeah. it, and you were young girls. Um, so there was to everything, right? There's kind of the shadow side that goes it's on everything. with it as right, well. Right. It's not um, all the shiny thing that you it's see. It's not all the right. shiny <laughs> things, but you learn and Discipline, so right? I was yeah. just good at it and right. it was fun. And, it was and fun. when you're a kid and you're just good at it, it's fun to get better at things. Right. It's fun to keep stretching yourself. And sure. I qualified for the US team that happened to be located in Woodside, California, which was about oh, about a 90 minute drive. Um for my parents. So we, before we were talking about the sacrifice of our parents, you know, my, yeah, yeah. my parents slept me 90 minutes and that was before the traffic was horrible in California. So it really only took us 90 minutes. Now okay. the trip probably takes two and a half hours, but, <laughs> <Right>. um, <laughs> you know, a couple, three days a week down to be That's... on the national team. Right. As I'm in middle school and, um, and those, teammates that I was on that team with are still some of my closest and dearest best friends. There's a bond that gets created. So yes, there's the challenge side of being a competitive athlete and you miss out on kind of quote unquote normal childhood things. And like there's being a, a level of stuff, right? Yeah. And, and there's <laughs> right. a level of pressure that sure. you're just under that's different. Um, but I, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I suppose it's got pluses and minuses and pros and cons, right? I mean, At my mom loved it. It kept prepared. us out of trouble. It, yeah. you're, getting, you're getting prepared for what will be life, right? Yeah. Like, you yeah. know, that's, that's good. But wouldn't it be nice if you could have screwed around a little bit? Who knows? <laughs> I mean, I you've got your whole. Around okay, also. good. Don't, don't worry about that. <laughs> okay, good. There, there was plenty of screwing around. Excellent. Um. So yeah. So I did that, and we were fortunate enough to compete for two summers in a row wow. in Europe, and it that was a phenomenal good. experience. Yeah. And I learned so much about myself and my capacity for what's possible and what I can do and my ability to perform and be in pressure filled situations. Yeah. And just, um, interestingly, just like an identity of excellence, which is, I think one of the things that I've taken with me my whole life. We we had a team name. We called ourselves the rockets. 
Oh, I love and it. Yeah. I will, we'll still text each other. You know, if you're having a hard time, here we are. I'm 41 years old, you know, yeah. however many years later, texting you're with my texting. friends. You're a rocket. You got this. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's, that, that, that makes sense though. You know, yeah. you, you've yeah. got that like foundational identity that you share. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. And we did crazy stuff, like 200 pushups in a day. And, you wow. know, like yeah. when you challenge yourself. Yeah, yeah. Like shared you, misery you, too. Like shared, shared misery. So yeah. much shared misery. Oh yeah. my gosh. So <laughs> much. And you're laughing about it. It's like, look at my toes. Oh my God. They're so gross. They're <laughs> right. so bloody right now. <laughs> right, right. Look I, at mine. Yeah, yeah. Look at my blister. Yeah. So I don't and, know that there's that shared camaraderie, but also that resiliency and that strength that, mm. um, that I got, you know, as yeah. a kid, which is pretty cool that that was, that became part of me. And, and as yeah. I've continued to move forward into the world to kind of have that, um, as part of my experience. The closest thing I ever came to that, and it's not close. Okay. It's not even close, but in my, in my screwing around sort of identity that I've made since high school, I guess, uh -huh. uh, I somehow just sort of showed up at like this uh, musical um, audition. Okay. So like a friend of mine was auditioning and we were going to hang out after school and I was watching these auditions and I'm like, man, these guys all suck. <laughs> better and, than they're, that. and they're singing on stage and they stink. Right. And I just get up there and I sing this stupid church song and everybody goes crazy and they end up being little Abner and little Abner. Fun. There's a little bit of pressure. Being little yeah. Abner and little mm -hmm. Abner, <laughs> <laughs> my one and only claim to fame, I think. And then awesome. it was all downhill from there. <clears throat> <laughs> anyway, mm. so I digress. So okay, so then you go on to be be top top in class in college yeah, and that grad achievement school. Thing just didn't, yeah. So it kind of like you got the achievement bug going on. Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay, I was bit. Yeah. So yeah, I'm like one of those weird people that I don't know if I've you're weird. Literally, no, I think I'm, I'm the weird one. I think I might be the weird one. But then again, we're in this. You know, I'm I'm saying the subset of all people that want to be on podcasts. I feel like a weirdo because I'm not <laughs> I'm not the type A overachiever type, right? <laughs> That's okay. I mean, it's okay. But everybody that I talk to, you guys, you know, not everybody's like you. So good on you. You know, mm. uh, there's a lot of people burnt out out there. But I know a whole lot of people that their life's ambition is to sit on a couch and watch TV. And that's okay, too. <laughs> yeah, there is. We each get to define success for ourselves and fulfillment. That's right. <laughs> you know, it, whatever it takes. That's what I say. Okay, so you get a prestigious career with a letter after your name and everything. So Yeah, I got all so, the stuff. So yeah. let's talk about... Um, your your pre burnout. What were you doing? You were a nurse practitioner. So I'm a family nurse practitioner. Right. So I've been a registered nurse, 15 years, and a nurse practitioner for about for 11 now. At this point, um, I worked in busy primary care. Right. I went to the top schools in the country and have been helping patients. Um, at, you know. Primary care office is, you know, where you're going for your checkups. That's where you go if you get right. a cold. That's where right. you're managing chronic diabetes and all of the high blood pressure and chronic health conditions. Right. This is the pace that is 20 to 30 patients a day, 15 wow. minute visits. Wow. That's um, a lot. It's a lot. That's it's a lot. a lot intellectually. It's a lot emotionally to hold space and hear because people are coming in with hard things. Right. And, and, you know, and, they're, and they're, they're hurting, they're suffering. That's they're a very pain, important 15 wrong. minutes for those people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And what I found was about probably 30% of my work was mental health wow. um, and helping people with things like stress and burnout and anxiety and depression. Um, and then probably another 50% are those physical things, the, the managing chronic diseases. Um, mm. And what I found is even in that, the thoughts in our mind and our mindset and our mental health is so really, really essential to mm. making change and kind of having improved outcomes um, as we're helping somebody move through a health challenge. And then, you know, 
10%, somebody needed some earwax removed or some antibiotics for <laughs> that, that's me. a UTI. Yeah. Or, you know. I accidentally got a Q-tip cotton ball yeah, stuck yeah, in yeah, my yeah. ear. And then, yeah. and then you and then you have like 1% of people who are actively coming into your office, like having a stroke or having a heart attack. And you're like, I'm sorry, you are in the wrong place. Please go to the emergency department. <laughs> Be calling Yikes. the ambulance now. So right. you know you get the gamut every day. It's, yeah, it's the gamut. Um, but I, I think as found- a group though that like self care is not really prioritized in your cohort there. No, <laughs> no, it's not. No. And one no. one, one might joke- think that you, yeah. you know I, people I, people in the healthcare industry would be healthy, but they're kind of not a lot. Well, the system is certainly not set up in, in right. order to an, allow us to have a work environment that right. is healthy. I joke I was pregnant through, through twice, um, fortunate to be pregnant twice while I was in clinic. And as women, we pee a lot during pregnancy. Yeah. And you literally don't even have time because you are booked every 15 minutes. Right. You know, walk into your day and your, your, your calendar is booked. Right. So I had to be like... I'm sorry. I will be right in with you. Right. I have to just. <laughs> but you know. I must do this. I must take care of this physiologic thing that must happen right now. There is no right holding it right. until lunch. <laughs> like if you're and not of course, pregnant, maybe you can. thought it was can. cute and loved it and right. they were fine. But. You, I think pregnant women do get a little bit of leeway. You know, uh, you you do. Oh my! It was actually really fun to be pregnant in the yeah. office. Well, you get to be funny. And real. Uh Uh-huh. Right. And you get to be real. And I kind of become a person because the goal with the patient is like, it's about you. You're coming in. I want to know what's going on with you. I want to know. It's not about me. It's not about my life. It's not, you know. It's like your nurse bot. Nurse bot 3000. You are well now. (laughs) Well, that's not how I behave. But yes, I think that's how. That's how we see you. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. 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 So I think it, it humanized me to a lot of my patients that I'd had for years. You know, right. it, was, it was kind of fun to get to talk about me. But I did joke at one point. I was like, I need to just put a button on my white coat that says, it's a boy. I'm due in August. <laughs> <laughs> that was the question I get all the of time. Course. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I get it. No, please don't touch my belly. <laughs> right. So at what point did you hit the burnout wall, as they say? Well, so I had a really interesting process with burnout in that I think because I was such an overachiever and a doer for so long and a performer and a, just a shower upper and uh, right. strongly identified with achievement. As yeah, they say. And, yes. and, and, and strongly identified with my mission to be there with my patients and to be a resource for them and to be a place where they could be listened to and heard and valued and seen mm. and that's huge craft whatever the diagnostic plan was um so a lot of focus on other and how i could be of service to them right um so i was not aware that i was burning out yeah most people aren't <laughs> i just right. had the strangest notion when my oldest son was about 2 You kind of wake up and you're like, is this it? This is the adulting thing that they all talk about. We're just going to keep doing this for the next (laughs) 40 to 60 years. Yeah. I remember remember those mornings. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You check things off your list, right? You're like, okay, I got the career. I got the job. I I got got the the husband. We got the house. I got the baby. Like, (laughs) Right, right, right. And and then you're going, this is what I'm going to do now. Right. This is what I'm going to do. This is as fun as life gets. Um, and I just right. found that I was really missing fun. Wow. Um, and, wow. and I had no other intention other than like, life should be more fun than this. Like, right. It should just be more fun. Were you feeling um, like super fatigue and and not I tired? wasn't. And I think that's, I just, I have a lot of energy. I know that now. Like I okay. naturally. Um, you can just bring it up. Yeah. I can just bring it up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I was, you know, I was exercising and prioritizing my health and oh, good. drinking water and, you know, those kinds of things. But um, I, I, it wasn't fatigue for me. Okay. Um, it was a really strong inner critic, a lot of depressive thoughts, you know. Okay. But, but I there, think I that. had lived <laughs> with that for so long because I do think that that was part of the athletics, kind of like that inner drill sergeant. Oh, right, right, right. Like, like – 
Quit keep your going, whining. Keep pushing. Quit your whining. Yeah. Yes. Quit your whining. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ten more push-ups. Hey, yeah, uh, I was in the military for. I, I get it. You're, there's yeah, no so no I, whining I, allowed. Yeah, it, yeah, I think I I think that that became an internalized voice, and mm. so and and even a voice that I wasn't aware that was kind of running the show in a lot okay. of ways. Right, right. But kind of keeping me going. And I dabbled in some kind of side hustles to try and find a different outlet that would give me creativity and a little bit more fun. And at that time, I was also starting to really see some of the cracks within the healthcare system in general. Okay. Um, At the beginning, as a clinician, you're just so concerned that you don't kill somebody. Boy, and and get in trouble and sued. And and get in trouble. Yeah. You're like, I'm like, don't miss a heart attack. Don't miss somebody (laughs) bleeding in their brain. (laughs) Yeah. Like, don't prescribe two medications. It's going to raise somebody's potassium and they're going to have an arrhythmia in the middle of the night. I can't imagine how they do this. (laughs) I can't. I can't. My wife and I are watching this show and it's all about uh, OBGYNs in Japan. And and I know. It's called Dr. Storks. My wife's from Japan, so it's not a weird oh, okay. thing. <laughs> so, and just like one of the shows, like one of the OBs, and she was recently finished her residency, so relatively new doctor, mm-hmm. right? Right. She right. was she was like part-timing at another clinic, and she kind of sort of noticed this patient was pregnant and was admitted because she was you know, suspected preterm kind of idea. And in Japan, Mm -hmm. they admit you when that happens. I don't Mm -hmm. know if they do that here. (laughs) I I don't have kids, so I don't, I know nothing about it. (laughs) But she noticed this symptom of like this, like her hand was shaking, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she's like, geez, I wonder if they tested her for thyroid, right? Right. And then she ended up dying in the show because of this, yes, during childbirth. And I'm oh like, my gosh. and of course that doctor is like, oh my God, what? why didn't I see that? Why didn't I report it? You know, and right. she reported it to her own doctor is like, did you check her for, you know, thyroid? And he's like, no, but I will. But it was too late. You know, right. It was already oh. in night. I know that I call this show like we can only watch one at a time because we're bawling. Because yeah. <laughs> like, babies space. are dying, I need a break. I need and to moms are dying, and it's like, oh, God. <laughs> might need a hot bath. I, nobody <laughs> thinks about that, you know. But it happens, you know. It does. So there is a lot of pressure in medicine. Yes. Um, and so at the beginning, you really are just paranoid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> paranoid. For, yeah, I and you're not it. in a place I, to be really. reflective no. or kind of. Critical. And you maybe you don't have enough experience under your belt. Like right. what I started to see about five years in was kind of like, and because I was in primary care. So I used to say I saw newborns to 90 year olds, but then I had quite a few patients in their hundreds. So that didn't work anymore. But so I saw the spectrum <laughs> right. of the human experience. Right. And over time, and with that volume, when you're seeing 20 to 30 people a day, it's a lot of humans that you are interacting with. A lot. Every day. And there almost became this like archetype. And I would be with a seven-year-old girl who was complaining of stomach aches and didn't want to go to school. And all of a sudden in my mind, I could flash forward and see where this little seven-year-old's, and and of course we checked for all the organic causes, but I could see where this seven-year-old girl's anxiety, what she was going to be like as a teenager. Wow. Wow. Because even though I didn't treat her, I've seen the teenager version of this. You're right. And I know what you're going to be like at 30. And I know what it's going to look like at 54. And I know how awful it's going to be by the time we get to 84. Because we don't have a good... So what I started to notice is people weren't actually getting better. Right. I was prescribing a lot of pills. Symptoms. I was making a lot of recommendations. I was following all the evidence that was, you know, recommended by standard of care, standard of care Mm. by, you know, yeah, all those different bodies. And if I was really honest with myself, people weren't actually getting better. Right. So I equated it to, it almost felt like, you know, that children's story, the emperor's new clothes, like where the emperor walks around naked and everybody else walks around saying, oh, your clothes are so pretty. You look so good. <laughs> I, I've heard the story. Yeah. 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 And it kind of felt like that. It's like all of us clinicians are like, oh, take this pill. You're going to be fine. It's going to do the trick. It's all these things. Right. And yet 
and I really resonate with it because people come in really vulnerable. They're sharing the hardest, most difficult thing that's going on in their life, and they're really seeking help from you to find a solution. Right. And finally, I kind of just had to say, like, this is not, if I'm really honest, it's not working. And I'm right. kind of selling you this idea and, in, you know, encouraging you that it's, it's all going to be okay and just do these things. And it wasn't working and people weren't getting better. And same with the recommendations, like, okay, if you just go exercise, but, and people would have sincere intention, like, I really do want to exercise. Right. I really do want to reduce my stress. I really do want to create a good sleep habit. Mm. But then there was this huge gap between knowing what to do and actually doing it and really closing totally. that gap. Right, right, right. And- Yes. As I became more aware of that, I just, and I kept listening to my patients too, because my patients kept saying like, oh my God, I do not want another pill for that. Like, don't mm. you dare tell me that my sleep thing, I need another pill. Right. I mean, there's plenty of people who do, who come in and it's kind of like McDonald's and they're like, I'll take this, 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 this off the menu today. <laughs> yes. Um, I know those people. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. And right. as a clinician, you have to learn how to, how you, how, how your practice is going to be with those. But for the most part, kind of this sincere genuine, authentic, really strong desire to be well. Right. And to, to, to have a solution to this challenge that is really impacting their daily life mm. on a daily basis. Right. And so I just knew we had to be missing something. I just okay. knew right. in my gut right. that there had to be something that we were not doing because it, this, and this wasn't working. And so right. I really went back to the research and dug into the research. And um, again, so at that time, I'm, I've got a side hustle. It's kind of like fun and it's with beauty products. And like, I thought this okay. was going to be like a fun, you know, like, I don't know. Again, need, I was need, just looking you, for, for fun. something fun. Right. And yeah. you sound like me. So yeah, you and, get it. And just, I'll do anything as long as I'm smiling while I'm doing yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> but then right. what was so cool is that is it opened my eyes to... So it's so interesting. Another part of medicine, not only is it not a wonderful environment for our physical health, but when clinicians do continuing education, it's always about the patient, right? It's always about what's the newest evidence? What's the new medication for this? What's the new treatment plan? What should we be using first line for high blood pressure? It's never about <clears throat> personal development or right. professional development, which is oh. so interesting because now that I work huh. with people in corporate, I'm like, oh, like professional development is a thing. You guys yeah. spend time All doing the time. this. <laughs> All the time. All the time. What? Yeah. No one does this in medicine. This is wow. not. Wow. Interesting. You do not. So, so, so you don't go this, and like, learn new things. You learn. You don't go learn new things. You don't. Okay. You learn new things about treatment. Diseases and treatment. Diseases. Right. But you're not doing reflection. You're not growing yourself. You're not mm. learning about your mindset. You're not learning about Yeah, just like you said, you're not doing personal development. They're not You're not doing personal not development. Trying to change you, right? They're just right. giving you more information in your cup kind of idea. Yeah. Oh, so right. so that was really illuminating to me. I was like, "Wait, wait, wait. There's a whole world out here right. of all these incredible resources." Um and so between that and then diving into more science um, and really trying to understand how do we actually create change? How do we create behavior change? And realizing that I didn't have to stay within the boundaries that were given to me because the boundaries weren't working. And so looking at the evidence base, looking at the subconscious mind, looking at some really exciting research and nervous system health and the endocannabinoid system and understanding that there's an incredible amount of evidence in our world mm. published in medical journals every year that we're not talking about <laughs> in traditional medicine. Right. <laughs> Thanks for saying and, that. Yeah. Yeah. And, <clears throat> us, and us people in the podcast world have been have been on this for quite a while. You but but yeah. we, we kind of like been thumbing you guys, like those guys. So now I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. So you're catching up. Yeah. We're That's catching up. Great. We're catching up. I'm catching up at least. So let's talk about some of these things that you learned because I'm fascinated with neuroplasticity. I yeah. think it's so amazing. I It's so amazing. I listened to this podcast with I don't know what kind of he was some sort of 
neuroscientist, you know, yeah. there's too many words going around, but this, he was an expert and probably a doctor, but more on the research side. Mm -hmm. And, um, and he had this theory about neuroplasticity and why we dream. Now mm -hmm. it's a theory. And he, he says, I'm pretty sure this could be wrong, but it's really fascinating to think about. It's mm -hmm. like why we dream is because if we don't dream, if we're not constantly putting visual um, input into our visual cortex, it's so much uh, the neuroplasticity of the brain will wipe it out with other stuff. It'll just rewrite it to do other stuff. Sure, if it's not being used. <laughs> if it's yeah, not yeah, being, yeah. yeah. So that's why yeah. his theory was, interesting, that's interesting, why we dream. I, yeah, I was like. Right, interesting that the, the visual inputs from the waking hours wouldn't be enough to keep that. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know either. But I, I was like, wow. I mean, because we've been thinking about why we dream for so long and dogs mm -hmm. dream and every, every you know, mammal with a big brain dreams, yeah. right? Yeah. That, that might be a really simple answer. Not saying that, that that's true. It's just a yeah. fascinating idea. <laughs> anyway. Could be true. <laughs> could be true. Anyway. So let's talk about like what you've learned and how you're putting it into practice about all these things. Sure. So yeah. So neuroplasticity, we can certainly start there. So just understanding how our brain actually grows and changes every day of our life. Your brain is different when you wake up in the morning than when you went to bed. Totally. The night before. You are a new person every day. And, and it has again, different needs too. Like at yeah. Night? And so yeah. we, before the nineties, maybe even before that, in the last 50 or so years, we really thought that the brain was static, that what you got, right. however it's it like grew, fixed. Yeah. you're fixed, you know, brain for, for men, great brain growth is done at about 24 mm. women a little bit earlier. And that's it. That's the brain you get for your life. And right. now we know that's entirely false, that the brain is constantly wiring and rewiring, creating new neurons, creating new connections, um, expanding capacity at all times. And that we can consciously choose to do this, right. that our environment does this for us, that, so there's some really cool, um, so I have an ebook that talks all about this um, because there's all of this science that was discovered back in the 90s that we're not implementing right. <laughs> in day-to-day -day life, which is just right. crazy. It's crazy, me. yeah. But really cool studies about um, taxi drivers because in the 90s, we discovered the MRI and the functional MRI came okay. online as a technology. Right. So we were able to see, particularly the functional MRI, mm -hmm. how – the brain is actually thinking and how the right. electricity and the messages like are being moved tracking through Tracking blood tissue. flow and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And so they looked at taxi drivers in London and they were able to see taxi drivers. We all remember those, right? Like those yellow cars that used yeah. to be on the road. Yeah. Well, they're, they're all doing Uber and Lyft now. <laughs> now they're, now they're yeah. Ubers, yes. <clears throat> yeah. But they were taxi and there was no <laughs> GPS and there was no cell phone in the front of their Right. Car giving them directions. That's so they neat. had to know. Oh, that know. could be like a, a, one of those crazy studies that they could do. Yeah. So they had to know all of the streets in London. They had to know right. how to get where, if there was traffic. They had that all map that in map their brain. Yeah. In their brain. <clears throat> and so their spa the spatial aspect of their brain was significantly larger due to their environmental exposures. Wow. So they were literally growing that part of their brain. Yeah. Similarly, they also scanned monks, Buddhist monks, I believe it was, mm. during that time. The high meditators, see, right? The high meditators to right. see that not only could your external environment change your brain, but your internal environment yeah. could change your brain. Right. So the way that you step into presence, step into awareness, mm. step into the present moment, right. are able to sit with your feelings and feel that those sensations right. that you can downregulate the activity in the amygdala, which is kind of our reactivity place and right. our fear place. They can quiet um, that default mode network like yeah, immediately. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So this is really exciting and we can use this understanding in our own lives about right. how we create the environment around us, both exter the external environment as well as the internal environment. Um, and, and just that no, and I think one of the other big pieces that's so exciting is we talk a lot about how trauma changes the brain mm, and yeah. we think about how one traumatic episode can change something in an instant. And I think what we need to also remember on the flip side of that coin mm. is that you can have positive change that quickly as well. Right. 
Totally. So we can we can undo and we can change something as quickly um, when we understand how our neurons talk to each other, how our neurons connect to each other, and get intentional about how we are using our brain. Mm. Um, and again, not only the con- the conscious part of our brain, but also the subconscious part of our brain, which is so, so the, much more. <laughs> so much more. So the subconscious <laughs> right. that we. So the research again, Yale's been doing research on this. There's a there's a whole lab at Yale that's dedicated to the subconscious that's been pumping out research for forty years. Right. To know that we, ninety percent of our actions that we take, the thoughts that we have, the feelings that we have, our behaviors mm. are habituated or patterned right. in our subconscious mind, and they're just kind of going off automatically, autopilot, default. And thank God. And thank God. And yes, thank God, because we would it's not a, be it's alive. A, it's a, well, it's a really great system, right? We it's, would forget to breathe. <laughs> and beat could, that heart. Could you, would, could you like, imagine? Oh, darn it! I forgot to keep the heart beating. Well, I, I I always like to think about it in terms of learned behavior. You know, mm-hmm. um, like if somebody said, you know, how do you drive, or how do you play a video game, or how do you do whatever you do? How do you talk? How do you talk? You don't know, right? Mm-hmm. You learn how, right? Mm-hmm. You program that in your computer. Mm-hmm. And then you forgot. And then every time you want to do the thing, you just go re- run the program. Mm-hmm. It's like mm-hmm. you've got like when I go out walking now, sometimes mm-hmm. I get so lost in nature. I'll, I'll start like, you know, my, your mind wanders. That's a really good thing to do when you're walking. Let your yes. mind wander in nature. Right. And then suddenly I'll, I'll hear this voice going, uh, you're you're off trail. <laughs> and I go, thank you, driver. <laughs> It's like I'm talking to the the driving program, or right. I guess it's, I could call them walking program in my yeah. brain. You know, it's, it's yeah, amazing. it's really fascinating when yeah. you stop and you think, <laughs> and and all of these things can be really used to again get us the results that we want in our lives. Totally, and the, the health that we want in our lives. And instead yeah. of fighting that, I mean, think about that. You're like trying to make a habit change. Again, it doesn't matter. You're trying to save money. You're trying right. to exercise more, like pick right. the habit. Doesn't you're obese matter. and you, and your, 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 uh, your family doctor says, well, you need to lose a hundred pounds and mm-hmm. stop drinking beer. Have, have a nice day. That's my prescription, right. you know, and they're not, there's no program to help you with that. You know, there's not like a six week or an eight week program that's covered by insurance. No, you just got to go do that. So yeah. my answer was, geez, you know, if I could do that, I would have done it already. <laughs> exactly. If I could do that, I would. Like, it's not a mystery. <laughs> right. And this is the piece. The the piece that I really work on with people is, like, there are tools and resources mm. to help you close that gap that can make it easier and much more effective. We just simply haven't been told them. But they're all right. out there. Right. This oh, is, totally. So when you get that subconscious mind, when you understand the subconscious mind, and particularly the nervous system too, I really like the nervous system mm. because the subconscious by definition is like, we. I mean, we don't even know really know what the mind is. We don't know what consciousness <laughs> is. You know, I mean, I know they, they've come up with the thinking models with AI and some, <clears throat> you know, maybe one day they'll figure out human consciousness, but we're not quite there yet. It's very woo-woo. As soon as you start saying consciousness, then you're in like spiritual land, you know, basically. (laughs) Again, Yale scientists, PhDs have been They're working on it. it. They're working on it. They they still uh, haven't got a a working definition that I'm completely on board with yet. You know, I've got mine. (laughs) It's more spiritual and philosophical. I I wouldn't argue that it's woo-woo. I think there's a lot of really good science for it. Oh, totally. Um, I'm not saying it's not scientific. I'm just saying it's not mainstream. How's that? It's not mainstream. Right. It's definitely not not mainstream. So when I say something's woo-woo, I'm saying the the mainstream is going to poo-poo it. It'll got it, got it, got woo it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm all in. <laughs> so I love the nervous system as well because we've all lived with our nervous system for our whole lives. And so it mm. it allows you to understand yourself and your body and kind of what's going on and, and it's how telling you things. Yeah. you're behaving. It's telling you things when right. you know how to map it, how to listen to it, and again, how to use it for whatever your goal is, right. whatever it is that you want to achieve. Um 
so, so yeah, so those are kind of some of the pieces that I incorporate into my work. And I found, again, after talking to 50,000 people, people are busy. People don't have <laughs> really <laughs> multiple. Exactly. We don't have yes. hours and hours to like, I think there's like this myth that wellness is green juice in the morning and putting your feet in the grass. And like, if you did all the things that all the gurus recommend, you'd spend your whole day doing wellness practices. And I don't know when you'd ever work or take care of your family or go to the bathroom. Right? And none of those practices are wrong. But if right. we're under the un, the perception that I need to do all of these things in order to be well, right? it's an impossible task and it's an right. impossible place to be putting ourselves. Mm. So I was like, I got to figure out how people can do this in the course of their day. Yeah. Fast and effective. Right. So right. that's where I really looked at neuroplasticity and understanding how the brain actually changes, paired that with subconscious reprogramming and self-directed neuro nervous system regulation. So all a lot of big, fancy, fancy words. But my goal is in one minute, you can realign yourself Wow! in that moment, in yeah. that instance. Yeah, yeah. And that's where I shared in, in that little clip in the beginning, like turn your triggers into glimmers. <laughs> That's when great. We, I love that. Yeah. When we all know what a trigger is. I do. Um, and a glimmer from the nervous system, per, from the science perspective, it is, it's the same thing. It's an external clue from your environment mm. rather than it making you get tight shoulders or a pit in your stomach or sweaty palms or anxious or angry or any of those things. Mm. It's a clue from the environment that tells you to exhale relax the muscles around your eyes. Everything's okay. We Mm. can move forward in flow, in connection with flexibility, with an open mind, with a curious mind. Like we don't have to be in that place of fight or flight and freeze and protection and aggression. Um, And so you really can turn. And and so I love it. It's like life will just give you the trigger and now you have the tool, just turn that trigger into Into a glimmer glimmer. and you're on your way. I like that. So every time you you feel one of those triggers where you think, you know, I don't want to feel this. Maybe I'll have a beer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or, right? That's exactly right. <laughs> don't do that, you know. Think, but, think about it. But when some... we say don't do that, right, that's... No, well, like... feel the thing. Yes, sure. right. Yeah. But maybe not have the beer. Come up with plan B or C. Yeah. Or D. It, yes. So just gives you empowerment. So, yeah. yeah so that's just what I Just being able that's to my... feel the feeling is really the key, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. I know, like... Okay, my my beer trigger feels like this. Yes. <laughs> and How can I turn in. that into a tr- into a glimmer? Right. And it can take time to figure it out, but yeah. once you It doesn't have to be like earth-shatteringly. Like, no, it's no, that's it's super the thing. Basic. It's actually yeah. really simple. Yeah. It's really simple when you've got these four steps and you can apply them. So that's the kind of the framework I developed for my clients to to help them do that. In, in the moments of their day, and it helps with mental health, it helps with all the habit changes, because at the end of the day, we have to do stuff, you have to take action. Yeah, <laughs> you have to make money. You have bills. to make money, you, you have, have to take yeah, pee, all those things. Even when you're pregnant, maybe a million yeah, times Yeah, exactly, <laughs> and you have, to, you, ha- you have to decide, is this the time that I am having the beer because it's okay to have beer, right. or is this the time that, nah, like, that's actually not in now, alignment now with what I'm saying, really I really time. value right. and like, right. maybe I can, let's try one other technique to kind of, it's yes, I'm weird. feeling this anxious feeling, but let's, let's lessen that feeling. Let's, you know, let's regulate that maybe nervous system. Maybe I systems. can just breathe or something. Yeah, exactly. Maybe I can just breathe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then I'm empowered to choose. I get to choose instead of the autopilot running the show that goes mm. trigger beer. Right. Exactly. And and there's no there's no space. I've got and a story no and, and and I want you to stop me as as you you find points to dive in. So okay. um I already told you my wife's from Japan, so that means mm-hmm. we have to take flights to Japan on a regular mm-hmm. basis. Mm-hmm. Usually once a year. Mm-hmm. And like years I would be like just in my mind like a 3-year-old whining. Right? Yeah. You, you know, like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm still here doing this, right? <laughs> I can't believe we're still on the train or on the plane. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? In my head. Are we there right? yet? I, are we and there I yet? can't believe everybody can't read my mind. 
that mm. I'm really tired and I just want everybody to shut up so I can go to bed. Right. <laughs> Mm, so unfair. Yeah, uh, so unfair. So uh, I I realized on during one trip that people actually couldn't read my mind. Yeah. And and I was like, maybe I'll just see if I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, okay, I'm kind of tired, but I'm okay. I'm kind of mm-hmm. dehydrated. Maybe I'll have some water. Um, uh, my body's sore. I'm going to walk around and move. Mm-hmm. And then mm, I don't think I can sleep anymore because my neck hurt. Right. I would just like try to problem solve instead of wine, <laughs> you know, and it was life changing. Like yeah. I would get to the airport and my wife would run her off and start doing her thing. Like, I gotta go and do all this stuff. You sit here and eat this sandwich and drink this beer and I hope you're happy, right? And I was just like as happy as a clam. And I still had four hours more of tr- travel in front of right. me, you know? But that little change of just like, maybe I'm okay. <laughs> and, and that is, that's huge. And and it, two pieces that I want to pull out from that. One is just the recognition of that voice. I mean, yeah, we all have that voice inside of our mind. And most of us aren't aware that it is there and it's creating a lot of tension. It's creating a lot of pain and suffering Mm. and despair and criticism and shame and guilt and difficulty. Like all those bad things (laughs) in in this voice that's in our mind. And again, it can, it, it can, if, Somebody's listening and they're like, I don't, I don't, I don't know what he's talking about. Like I've never right. had that voice. I like to recommend people go into the shower, mm. right? Where it's quiet yeah. and just think, notice how you can still hear something. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's that voice. That's, that's or, the voice. Yes. Or walk by a mirror or go into a dressing room because those ones tend to be, you tend to get the like really negative quick, louder voices. So that voice, even though we might only hear it. And so that was so cool that on the plane, I think maybe because there was a decrease of stimuli and like you were kind of stuck, there was nothing else yeah, to do. You, you've got you, nowhere to go. There right. were, you weren't getting off the plane right. in the middle of. No, um, you are, you are literally stuck. You're there. And, and so there's there, nothing there piece, you can do about it. Right. Yeah. So there's a piece right. of acceptance that had to happen exactly. because you couldn't distract yourself. <laughs> right. And then a curiosity, like you really had a great curiosity about like, well, what is this? You know, I always think it's important. Like, what is this voice? Where did this thought come from? Mm. Is this thought real? Is this thought helping me? Right. Who benefits from me continuing to have this thought? <laughs> right. Because right. a lot of the thoughts that we right. recycle through yeah. are just conditioning that are incorporated. And it makes a lot of people money if we continue to think these things about ourselves or feel these things about ourselves or <laughs> right, say right. these things about ourselves on the inside. Um, and that's so neat that you were able to just be like, and I love that ability to simply move almost just into a neutral space. Mm. Like this doesn't have to be the best time of my life flying. <laughs> How many ways is it? 16 it, hours, 24 it, it, hours. Whatever it is. It's just too whatever damn long. <laughs> yeah. Am I Okay. Yes, that's a wonderful Am I question. Am okay? That's a wonderful so that's, question. It's a great question, and it's yeah. actually the top of the mammalian nervous system. Yeah. So that is, so we, get right, evolution. Right. We built building blocks, build on things. At the level of reptiles, we had the sympathetic, that's where the sympathetic nervous system, fight, fight or, or flight, flight comes right. in. Yep. You know, like, are you an alligator that's going to attack me? I'm going to fight back. Um, and when mammals evolved after reptiles, a a block got added to the nervous system called ventral vagal. And that is the place where we are able to, the fancy science words are neurocept, which is read the environment to tell, am I okay? And it's what Mm, I, it's what allowed us to move from the asocial reptiles into social creatures as mammals. So I was able with my nervous system to be like, hey, Jeff, you're okay. You're not going to eat me. You're not going to attack me. I can take a step closer. Mm. We can step closer. And then from there, now we can, we can build trust. We can build collaboration. We can right. build community. We can do so much more 
right. together yeah. um, as social creatures. And But it starts with, am I okay? Right. It, like, it, or is this Are you going to eat me? <laughs> that's great. That's awesome. So, so that's so cool that intuitively you, and again, that's why well, I love this. Well, it took years and years and years, you, you know. You knew it. Right. Like you yeah. knew that was a beautiful question to ask yourself of like, am I okay? Am I okay? Okay, yeah. Is this the most fun it's, I've it's ever such had in a, my life? But the, no. the, the thing is, is like it, it sort of like transcended the plane, right? Yeah. It it works all the time. It works all the time. It, <laughs> it does. Works, it works all the time. The other it's thing the time. that like my favorite insight that I just had reading a book. Um so now I have to remember the guy's name. Ugh, I'm I'm crap at names. Anyway, he's like a happiness teacher. Uh Arthur C. Brooks wrote a book oh, uh-huh. with Oprah. Mm-hmm. Um and I forgot the title, but it's the latest one and the only one he wrote with Oprah. But it's come kind of like Create the Life You Want or something sure. like that. One of those self-help books. But he told the story about his uh, mother-in-law. Mm-hmm. And his mother-in-law on her deathbed was like recounting just how happy she was. Right? Um, happy and in spite of like a horrible, horrible external experiences mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. health and death and mm-hmm. sorrow and grief and just mm-hmm. horrible external mm-hmm. experiences at some point she was just like you know I, i'm not my external lo- world is not going to change anytime soon it's right. not going to get better anytime soon but i still have to live my life Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? No matter huge what. Huge amount of surrender and acceptance. Exactly. Right? It's like, and me being sad about the shittiness of my current situation isn't helping. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. It isn't helping. Mm-hmm. It's not the best mm-hmm. way to unfuck this shit. <laughs> right. Right, right, right. And there's right. no time where, like what you're saying, there's no time where there's not going to be hard. There's right. no time where there's not going to be. And the world ease. is always horrible. I mean, if you mm-hmm. want to see mm-hmm. horror, you can go find it in three seconds, right? Yep. You mm-hmm. can, if mm-hmm. you stare at it all the time and think, well, let's just pack it in, you know, that's not going to make it better. <laughs> I want to share one thought on that because I was just yeah. having a recent conversation um, on another podcast Good for um, you. about <laughs> happiness. Yeah. And I, I think what trips us up as Americans mm. it, and English speaking people right. is the word we have in our language is happiness. Right. And the definition of happiness is pleasure and contentment due to external circumstances or current situations. Right. It's kind of a bad And word. so we, this is the ideal that we're striving for. Right. Which then says that everything on the external has to be lined up and perfect in order to feel this thing called happiness. Right. And what's cool about language is even our own English language, 40% of it is borrowed. So it comes from Germanic languages or other like that's right. Again, evolution of humans and how we talk and all those things. And so I find it really helpful to look at other cultures around the the world. Okay, good. Not not to Uh, steal or anything like that, but to You're borrowing. (laughs) <laughs> but to and and to enrich, Learn. I would even yeah. say to enrich, okay, what this human experience is because I, I, my patients taught me Spanish. I speak medical Spanish, and there is there's like <laughs> language. It's like, like it. you are kind of a different person, and you feel a little different, and you learn something different in a different language. And so I take it from that place. But within Sanskrit, so ancient language from India that Hinduism is based on, there's a word called sukta, which is a genuine lasting happiness independent of external circumstances. That's a good one. That's a good one. And so, but if we don't have a GPS, if we don't have a marker for what we're searching for, Mm. then, and again, all we've been given in the English language is happiness (sighs) and happiness is dependent on the outside then we're constantly dissatisfied because right. like what his mother-in-law was experiencing, there is right. so much heartbreak right. and pain and challenge. Right. And so how can we, but, but within this human condition, 
as she experienced. I don't know if you've read Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Love that That's book. like one of my That's favorite my books favorite of all books. time. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. When he finds um, that fish you, head and he's so happy, it's like, wow, okay, perspective. But, but just, the, <laughs> just the reality that your yeah. external circumstances can literally be hell on earth. Right. And you can still there is joy. still the power of response within. Right. Um, it, I think is really powerful for us to just remember, like, what are we seeking for? What are we searching for? And if there isn't a word for it in our language, it's okay to kind of Let's use take direction technique. from other human beings yeah. that have shared this same experience of yeah. walking on this planet and walking through hardship and walking through challenge and still finding that joy and that happiness and that flow and that connection and service and all those things, mm. um, even with the chaos. Yeah, that was huge for me. It's kind of mm-hmm. like my favorite thing that I've learned. Yeah. I'm, at least in the holiday season. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, awesome. it's really good. And mm-hmm. uh, I think um, Arthur Brooks made up a word and it's silly. So I like silly. I'm a, I'm a fan of silly. So oh, instead of, silly. yeah, he says happy yearness. <laughs> happy. Happy yearness. Happy yearness. You can't be happy because if you're always happy, that would, you would like, again, that would be silly. You're walking around and you're always happy, <laughs> but you well, can. Well, it's not real because again, it's happiness real. is based, it's yeah, based it's, on it's external circumstances. Exactly. And we know it's external just a, circumstances it's a bad, are not it's a kind of bad always. word, right? Right. But his, his point is, is you can always continually until the day you die, be a little bit happier. Okay. And that and that pursuit is a pursuit of happierness. Happierness. <laughs> and it's silly. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> this has been a blast. So thank you so much for hanging out with me for about an hour. So let's yeah. talk a little bit more about Leah Durante. Am I saying that? Durant Durant? Wait a minute, Jimmy Durante. There we go. <laughs> you got Le- it. Jimmy Leah Durante. Durante. Leah Durante. <laughs> Leah Durante.com. And uh, and then that uh, that thing that you wanted to say about what was it twenty twenty yeah so I'd love to invite yeah. anybody who's interested in joining this free masterclass again one hour a day if you sign if you can't join us live you can always sign up and the recording will be sent out but we're really diving into why the New Year's resolution change model doesn't work for any of us right. and what we can do instead and so. It should be a really fun class and a great way for people to have a different framework and a different way of seeing um, going into this year so that you can create the results and achieve the goals and the dreams that you have in this year. And then if, again, on my website, I've got a free nervous system quiz so you can find out your nervous system quiz, leahdurante.com. There's the free ebook at leahdurante.com slash ebook. So Lots of great things over there on that website that are all free and resources for people to learn more about this really exciting science that people aren't talking about that can create effective change in our life. The rewire you. I like it. (laughs) This is great. All right, Leah, this has been a blast. You have a good one. Don't hang up Okay, thank you so much. Thanks for taking the time to ride along with us on another episode of Vroom Vroom Veer. For podcast info and show notes, be sure to head over to vvveer.com. That's triple V-double-E-R.com. Man, that's fun to say. And we'll catch up with you next time here on Vroom Vroom Veer.